Ladies and gentlemen, people of YouTube and beyond, however you're watching, welcome back to the dojo. As always, I'm Ryu. He's H. We're rolling out of the reaction and into this uh, probably a little shortened discussion of My Hero Academia, Season 5, Episode 11. But there were a couple things I just wanted to break down personally and just talk about really quick because of sheer, you know, comedic value because uh, I love me some comedic value in case anybody was uh, not getting that from uh, all our other stuff. I... I, I highly value comedy above pretty much all else when it comes to stuff like this. How, how do you work in comedy into the seriousness? How, how well is it, uh, you know, received and just done in general? And well, I pretty much called one, even though it wasn't really that hard of one to call. But uh, <laughs> I still enjoyed the hell out of it. It's what I'm getting at. So, but we'll get to that in a I, second. I like comedy. Comedy is one of my preferred things too. But for me. It's all about character. I could do, I'm fine with a mediocre story if there's good characters behind it. Yeah, I could agree. But um, for, for me, I, I at this point, I, I just live for the uh, uh, the comedic value of whatever they're trying to do, even if it's just a, a purely comedy show. But uh, as, uh, as we've seen in MHA as well, or any other anime that we're doing, uh, just, how how do they hit the nail on the head in certain situations and especially like uh we recently watched uh the new season of red versus blue and uh their comic relief guy uh while it was a transitional period season like hey this is basically a new show um with the red versus blue tag because of the whole thing with rooster teeth and bernie um their comic relief character if they're going to continue having raymond be that guy he needs some work <laughs> Yeah, like like I said after we watched it, I am fine with it as a thing. Like the, the actual the new way direction of the show, I'm fine with it. But yeah, Raymond is rough. They definitely need to either introduce some more comedic relief characters, or at very least, uh, really work on him. Right. Because he only had of his like two dozen attempts at comedy, only like one or two of them were actually all that funny. Right. Yeah, it was it was but again you have to take it for what it is in that case just really quick talking about uh, red versus blue zero here uh, for those of you uh, that don't know what we're talking about here for a second um yeah it's a transitional period for that show and it's it seems to be more or less going toward a more action-based uh a show and they they still try to keep some of the comedy in it while the 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 one-liner that hit the hardest was tucker and that's obviously you know it's tucker so he kind of he kind of saved it for the whole season, even with that just solid one liner with the whole bow chicka bow wow thrown in there too. But he's always got to get it in there. Sachi exactly, phrasing first, boom, right. But that aside, yeah, yeah, I'm usually more of the, the how how do they work comedy into any, any kind of situation, even if it's a predominantly a uh, comedy based show. And I, I enjoyed what they did here with uh, with Uraraka here at the end of the episode. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> She honestly freaked out less than I thought she would. She did freak out less, uh, which I'll have something to say about that in a minute. But th this episode started off with Midoriya having reined in the dark whip, the black whip, whatever the heck it was that was called, the whole whip power from the man, <laughs> mind you. Still my, still that still man again. <laughs> it's that man again. Is that is that going to be the new thing? It's that man again. Who, who was he? I have no idea. Oh my, do you know who this guy is? Nope. Like I said, they're probably gonna have to dive into some records and like talk to like Gran Torino and go through some like previous hero registries to like find out. It's like, I know what he, he Deku obviously knows what he looks like. So it's just like, oh yeah, it's this guy. So then we'll get a name through like research or whatever, something like that. In before it takes them like the rest of the season to figure out who the hell it is because this guy's actually like the second guy who got right, the it's... power or something like that and it's like it's been like hundreds of years since he was active right he, he did i will say that though he did have like traditional what seemed like like a traditional hero garb basically like he looked like he had equipment he had like like a look going for him he wasn't just like you know yeah, some I, guy I, in a suit you know what i mean yeah, i was i was mostly joking based on yeah like his actual like his demeanor and his appearance he is from the the actual hero society he wasn't one of the ones who predates the hero society like the original does uh 
So if I had to guess, he's probably like five. Right. Like early on into Hero Society, but at the point where Hero Society was already in, fl- in like in form. Right. And this episode was titled Our Brawl, and it was exactly that a brawl everybody was in within like 40 feet of each other until uh monomo was captured by uraka and hey, it was everyone, just get in here pretty much hey everybody get in here you know full on you know there's a hearthstone reference for you if you had an over under and hearthstone references you just won like no money because there were no betting lines on that but you know you get what i'm trying to say um but yeah it was, it was definitely they, they didn't focus on the brawl as much as like they showcased other fights in this but that's fine because what was going on with Deku was obviously more important um yeah we figured that going in that this was going this whole fight was going to primarily be a this was primarily going to be about uh Shinso and Deku with sides of Araraka and Monoma right well, uh, they still did manage to pull off crap like this, where I landed on it just like uh, Mineta landed on that. Yeah. So he is now, uh, as we mentioned at the end of the reaction, he is he's he's the guy that's probably going to be the most underestimated, but the most capable in just being able to capture people because his he- power is broken it's just the fact that he has such a shitty little personality to actually to actually like focus on using it correctly right <laughs> while, while he was doing the correct theme thing and placing the traps and then to use his traps offensively as well as defensively and using the shield which was you know a brilliant way to stop the kinetic force behind that projectile he still had the wherewithal to have the pervy nature of well this is going to protect her but it's also going to propel me into her enough to do this <laughs> yeah it's just he's he has a lot of potential with the way his power works and everything like that but the thing is he never does anything without some sort of ulterior pervy motive right which and that, that really limits his actual potential as a hero right so that that that, that leads us to speculate if there's like no hot women around for him to save is he gonna bother <laughs> probably not because like even in the whole like resolution thing of fighting the teachers and stuff like that that ultimately was something that was really pointed out is like well, by uh recovery girl is like y- yeah wanting to be uh, wanting to be popular or loved by girls is motivation but at the same time it's also a very skewed motivation he, can't you can't always really rely on for him because of that right but uh that aside his power is very strong and he his his pervy nature aside he is uh very capable of doing things that are uh obviously very team oriented and he could take care of things on his own if you know push comes to shove especially with the way his power has evolved with the uh, obviously his endurance has increased massively from the beginning of the series like take the uh the attack on the uh uh the training facility in the first season he could only throw maybe like a couple dozen before he started bleeding like just in this shot alone there's like 25 things on the shield and probably possibly hundreds of the little uh, sticky balls just scattered throughout the battlefield so his endurance is massively uh, increased uh, as this series has gone on. Yeah, the USJ. The, yeah, the USJ. Um, but while we're still in this shot, uh, we were talking about Mina at the end of the reaction. We still have... We, we know a reasonable amount about Mina, but then again, we don't. <laughs> we know... We know a reasonable amount about her, but we don't know enough about her because, like, we know like how her pa- some of her powers work. The fact that she is physically like one of the superior students, especially for one who doesn't actually have a battle quirk, like one that actually enhances her physical abilities in any way. But we don't really know any of her limitations, her uh, the upper limits of her strengths, 
we don't really know like anything we only have a very basic understanding of her like origins and motivation right she like she's right on that weird border of like she's still technically a supporting character but we know a lot about her for being a supporting character (laughs) Right. She, like, hasn't got, like, the spotlight that, say, uh, Jiro and then the whole Red Riot arc, uh, and who was the third one? That's the thing. That's the thing, freaking, uh, Kirishima's Kirishima's stuff, like, pretty much everything we know about her is indirectly through Kirishima's backstory. Right. But she hasn't had her own personal spotlight of just, like, doing something with, like, a pro hero or anything like that. Um, But I I assume, like, we talked about this before, that every... I assume the majority of the characters that the author is going to try to push will probably get that, you know, Jiro with the festival spotlight or uh, the whole Red Riot arc with... uh, you know, with uh, fat gum and all that kind of thing. Just something to that effect yeah. for... And then, you know, uh, Suyu kind of had that with that, like, anime original episode. Yeah, I mean, the the author has said that he more or less wants the entirety of Class 1A to be kind of like main characters in their own story, and that they're all supposed to get at least some spotlight and main character status. But it's right. just a matter of, like, what ones does he prioritize and when does he actually give them their development. Right. And then Ito was the other one who had a, a major, like, uh, story, uh, just in general. He, he, he's been around, but he hasn't been around a lot lately, which, hell, they kind of wrote out Bakugo, like, for half a season as well. He was around, but he wasn't really showcased in any way, shape, or form. So, it, it we've talked about this before, too, is just, like, it, that's the problem with a show that has, like, 70-something named characters. You know, we were talking about this at the beginning of the season with the whole rabbit girl thing. It's like, I assumed we'd see more of her this season, which people were excited for that from what uh, I, I, you know, that we read and stuff like that. But I assume she's going to be in the villain arc. You know what I mean? She's going to be a fairly predominant character in the villain arc. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's going to. The fact that she showed up with the whole Dobby thing. I'm pretty sure she's going to have some relevance here because once again, she's a very, from everything I've heard, she's very much a community favorite character from the manga. Right. So she's got to have some relevance at some point. Right. I I highly doubt they're going to like completely like show her for the anime. Um, Speaking of that, uh, the movie is coming out in July, I believe, or it was August. And it's going to be interesting to see where the third movie lands because of the title being World Heroes or something like that. And uh, Bakugo was already in this garb, and they were talking about how this was the like their winter attire. So it's going to be interesting to see where that movie lands uh, canonically, since they did say the previous movie was canon and technically did happen. So it'll be interesting to see if that this movie actually the net the third movie is actually a thing that is supposed to be somewhere like maybe between the school arc and the villain arc or something like that or what they're gonna do with it yeah we'll have to see and look into that because yeah that was the thing uh, the previous movie was kind of weird on is the fact that it was technically it was an anime original movie but one that the author considered canon right so it's it's gonna be interesting to see where that will fall But yeah. Moving along, uh, Monoma did uh, refer to himself as a as a support, and that was pretty funny in and of itself. He had he did have the ace up his sleeve, which he did kind of like back. He barely backhanded uh, Midoriya, like he he barely like it was just like a very glancing blow, and uh, just just being able to see uh, the power of the double shot obviously how much harder that is if just like a glancing blow like that turns into like something that literally knocks Midori out of the air that uh, that double shot power on its own is pretty strong and that it's fairly telling to how much uh, like Monoma can take of that power wise for his copy it, it would appear that he can almost basically do 100% of what they can do yeah 
even if it does have the he did mention later that they there are like residual effects like if he made like that giant uh, nut bolt uh just remained larger for a, a period of time just because of how his uh copy power works it just kind of like lingers or something so that's kind of a weird side effect that may come up in the future yeah it's basically how he explained it is even when he stops using the power it doesn't mean the power just disappears because he can only still manifest one power at a time this does clarify that it's not the fact that he hues powers though but rather that he can actually have multiple powers stolen simultaneously and it's just that he can only ever manifest one at any given time right so it's more or less kind of along the lines of what I was thinking with the whole like, you know, each each clock that he has just kind of shows off or potentially shows off because he was really trying hard with the uh, Uraraka to misdirect like you have no idea how many powers I can copy because she assumed three and we still don't really know what the exact number is. Like he said, he could very well be just misdirecting with the three, uh, the three clocks on his hands, but he had like three more on his belt. Well... The three on his belt were the three on his hand. He just put them on his belt after his initial pose off. Oh, okay. Um, that said, though, we do know he has... His limit is at least four. Because Poltergeist, size, double impact, and then he attempted to use, uh, to use Deku's power, but it drew a blank. So that's four powers that he had at any given, at any given time, even though Deku's didn't actually work for him. Right. And as he stated, his limit is apparently 10 now, 10 minutes now instead of five. Yeah, so him, it would be weird if his power didn't improve. So he, he has to be, you know, telling the truth about one of those things. So at least one of those things. He could be telling the truth about the whole damn thing just based on his character. You know, he, he could tell you an extravagant paragraph that could have any myriad of things, and you, you could think he's lying about half of it, but when then in truth he's lying about the whole thing, he could be lying about two things in it, or he could be telling the truth about the whole thing. He, that's just how his character is. You never really know what he's being serious about at any given point. Other than being, you know, when he's being flamboyantly ridiculous and going off and the the rails and getting smacked in the back of the head by kendo <laughs> well that's just the thing about his character he's a theatric deceiver his whole thing is he essentially he plays the fool right oh yeah moving along here uh, we got this whole uh, little backstory of uh well yeah he's a uh... <laughs> Shinso is definitely wrapped up in his own uh, capture device. He stepped in his own trap, basically, <laughs> while training. <laughs> so that, that was definitely uh, uh, just like a nice little touch that they added here where, you know, obviously he was training with Aizawa, and I was wondering if they would actually do anything with that. And as Aizawa does mention, he didn't have any help. He learned how to use the binding cloth on his own. So, yeah. That is one thing, like, Aizawa backstory clarification we got is the fact that apparently it took him six years to fully train his own fight, to fully train his own fighting style. But as he said, one of the main reasons why it took him so long is because he he's entirely self-taught and it's his own, like, custom fighting style that he came up with. Right. So if someone's teaching, you got to figure it's going to cut down on the, the time to at least become proficient in it. Maybe not master it, but reasonably proficient in it to uh be uh, successful like they already showed with uh you know shinzo's already capable at this stage of like doing a reasonable amount of stuff with the binding cloth so which it seeing shinzo with the binding scarf actually uh does clarify something that people were curious about and speculating about it's the whole thing is they people thought it was some sort of like weird residual effect of Aizawa's quirk that allowed him to like remote control the cloth but apparently that seems to just be a thing with the cloth in general because even Shinso can do it Right. somehow or another it's more or less connected to your thoughts in a, in a sense it right. gives you like some sort of like minor telekinesis powers over the cloth yeah because they still haven't uh, fully explained uh once again, this is several hundred years in the future. This is like not near future, like 2050. This is like 2400s ish. Um, 
while the technology to like go into space isn't there this kind of tech hasn't been fully explained um yeah they yeah they're technologically repressed when it comes to like overall societal technology and like major scientific discovery like space flight and stuff like that but they're more advanced when it comes to things relating to heroes and stuff like that because that's where pretty much all of their technological focus has turned is developing uh tools for heroes to use because that's more or less where their entire society has shifted to is okay how do we as a society work around this concept of heroes right basically everything has shifted to be hero centric so at some point we're, we're gonna need like an entire like 10 minute segment of uh maze uh baby academia to explain all these things even if it's just like a random short that's put off uh not in the show itself because the whole uh thing with may was awesome and really needs to come back if that was a one-off thing i'm gonna be really sad because <laughs> the comedic value was amazing obviously but just her just doing that as just like a general here's some facts for you kind of thing is just like a neat addition to the show in general since yeah, like that's her character. I, 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 I really do hope Mighty the Academia actually turns into a thing. So far, it doesn't seem like it is going to be a thing, but that would be a really welcome addition to the show, both just because it's more May, it's comedic, but then it's also you know actually giving you information about the stuff that they couldn't really, they wouldn't really be able to necessarily work into the episode itself without it be, seeming super expository. Right. And it, it, they don't have to be long. They, that that well, that singular one they did earlier this season was perfect length. It's not obviously you don't have to do one every episode, but whenever there's like something like that that needs to be explained, like Morgan Freeman style, why not just have her do it really quick? Just have her interject and then go back to the episode. <laughs> but yeah, um, we did get uh, we did get uh, number three over here because they did do a freaking flashback. So that that counter is going up. We were uh, talking about this uh, off camera earlier where uh, we didn't know if uh, we were jokingly making that counter over there. And I'll you know, it's right on my uh, this side of me right here. We, we didn't know if they were going to they're kind of straying away from it. But we're on number three now. We, they have they have gone back to it. So that was the third iteration of that this season. So 11 episodes and they've done that flashback three friggin times. So as long as we see that scene over there, uh, that number is going up. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see if we get anywhere near double digits by the end of the season. I doubt it. Uh, I'm going to assume maybe five. Maybe we'll hit five. But my over under is five. If I recall correctly, season one, which is only a one core season, showed it like five times. Uh, and then season two I don't remember exactly how many it was in season two but I'm pretty sure if I recall correctly by the end of season two which was a two core season it was double digits already yeah because when we were re-watching this uh, before the before season five started uh, I didn't have the counter like I had the uh, <laughs> like the uh, the Ryuji counter I had going for uh p5 with the the for real counter but uh it was still up there <laughs> so I, i'm thinking the uh, solid over under is five especially if the second arc is going to be mostly villain focused so the odds of uh having that uh, flashback again for any reason will be a kind of whatever yeah it's predominantly comes up whenever we're having like deku focused shenanigans because that's something the thing that he always freaking goes back to right and while uh you know they were still establishing all the other characters and deku was still predominantly the big main character of the show that it was just kind of something they were doing like constantly but yeah as we can see here uh well he did use it we were talking about that before uh before we started on the reaction earlier was will he use uh the dark whip in this episode and he did use it but uh it basically yeah, short-circuited him. <laughs> yeah, he can't... He cannot reliably use the more advanced powers until he's at least most of the way done mastering just the basic power. 
because these these other quirks obviously take like, significant they take even more out of him than just using the basic strength enhancing right so his uh, swiss army knife of powers is probably gonna have to uh be on the back burner especially depending on how frequently he like learns about a new one because i wouldn't say that every single manifestation of a power is going to be like this where it just like happens and goes out of control and someone has to rein him in he could literally just like have a dream about it and it's just like hey this is my power you should totally try it you know what i mean well yeah because now we have we're at the point of all the previous wielders are actively trying to reach out to him and like the like that man said uh he just happened to be the first because Deku essentially called to him unintentionally. Right. It's that man again. <laughs> oh man, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what what his deal is because I'm sure uh, for each wielder there'll be at least you know five to seven minute backstory for like what their deal was, uh, other than just being that man previous wielder <laughs> full avatar uh, full avatar cycle stuff once again i'm pretty confident that he's either like four or five on the uh generational order yeah um i don't know if we got we, did we ever see aizawa kind of uh, using uh the binding cloth basically going full spider-man yeah we did yeah okay want to do uh since that was something that shinso did do in this episode he's basically going full spider-man with it so uh, i didn't know if we yeah, had seen that before or not kind of blanking on that myself uh in the uh exam against the teachers he was he uses the uh, i believe a few other cases he uses the binding cloth as basically a grapple hook yeah right okay um it's kind of weird that this like shot right here just kind of reminds me of like just like he, he it looks like he's just like a macy's parade balloon you know what i mean <laughs> she's just like all right this is the Oraraka parade and here's my monoma balloon and my monoma float <laughs> <laughs> i mean essentially that's what her power lets her do though because it makes them weightless so they're basically just a balloon that she's dragging around right <laughs> I mean, it definitely makes it easier for her to uh, move, uh, like, captured enemies from place to place. So that, that was definitely a thing. Which uh, he was still doing his mind game shenanigans here, which props. And I, I guess there was no... Uh, if your quirk is usable while you're captured, I guess there was no rule against that. Because he did use it while he was captured. Yeah, I mean, they never really, they never stated one way or the other whether or not you could still use your powers while you were captured. It was just, once you were in the cage, you counted as captured and were a point for the enemy team. Right. But yeah, they, never said, they never said one way or the other about whether or not you were allowed to still potentially interfere with the match from the cage if you could. Right. But uh, the other thing, I guess, that happened at the end of this fight here was... Uh, Uraraka making the correct choice and just trusting Deku to handle it and just go back and support the uh, the team as a whole because her return actually was uh, a reasonably big turning point in that brawl that was going on because she caught all of them off guard because all of them basically assumed that she would you know after she after she captured Monoma that she would go back and help Deku uh so she just kind of showed up and just RKO'd all of them off the board. <laughs> I mean, she only actually caught uh, size, but uh, either way, yeah, her her showing up through the power balance out of whack because they all expect they all figured that she was just going to stick to Deku, and they were just abusing the fact that it's a three v two. So when it suddenly transitioned into being a three v three, it threw their whole plan off track and cause them to basically just chain lose right but yeah rolling in on the end here um they were uh once again this was not for all the marbles because you know 
the the unbiased commentary finally ended with uh with, with midnight here i believe is uh the the sign jiro was holding up Let's see if i can mina's pose she just had to do it i guess but uh yeah there it is uh <laughs> yes well, as I say, Midnight is committed to fair commentary. Vlad King and his biased commentary should be replaced immediately. Yes. <laughs> well, since he was, you know, off trying to see if they had to, you know, intervene in the match and stop it, which is kind of weird, just just from a, 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 a teacher standpoint, that all Might wasn't the one who stayed back because he's, you know, Small Might and can't really do anything to, you know, intervene in a match, even though I guess Aizawa well, and Vlad could handle it, but... He just... was the one who called for the intervention in the first place, so he was more or less... He the, he was the one making the judgment call, so right. that's, why he, he, that's why he went. Right. But yes, it was very much going to be Aizawa and potentially Vlad who actually stepped in in the event intervention was necessary. Right. But, you know, at the end of the day, you would think uh, Midnight would have been the uh, easiest person to just kind of, like, blanket, stop the fight, just put everybody to sleep. <laughs> but, yeah, that is definitely one hell of a sign that she's holding up there. And uh... <laughs> Aoyama is just kind of, hey, don't forget about me. I'm actually in this show back there because <laughs> he hasn't really done much this season. No, he just sits in the background and twinkles. Pretty much, that's that's his job, always twinkling. That's that's just what. He, oh, I I didn't notice that. Jiro and uh, Hagakure are holding up that sign. Yeah, I was actually just going to comment <laughs> on that because I didn't know if you realized it or not yet. But Hagakure I was thinking to myself, I was like, how is she holding that up from d just way over here? Why isn't she in the middle of the sign? <laughs> Yeah, no, Hagakure also making her token appearance here because, you know, she's not allowed to actually be a character yet. Right. Whatever is going on with her, and we've speculated about that in the early on in, in the season, whether that ends up being true or just red herring, we'll have to see. But I was just like, I was thinking to myself, why is she holding up that sign from just the freaking left side of it? What's going on here? <laughs> but yeah, that, that sure is Hagakure. She, she exists, just like in that like ending shot, the... Uh, Sugar Rush is standing behind All Might, like, yeah, I'm, I'm still a character too. It's like, are you though? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then we just basically rolled into the, the quick wrap up of uh, the fights and them basically saying Shinso passed, and I guess we'll see what class he'll be placed in. Uh, the most likely is Class B, but they may shake it up and actually make him a semi-main character since he's supposed to kind of be a Deku foil and stick him in Class A. Right. So we'll, we'll just have to see where that goes because we talked about in the reaction, everybody has their provisional license, so I don't think they're going to be removing anybody like the rules previously stipulated, like, you know, if somebody's underperforming, that somebody could basically just rise up and take their place. They're just probably just going to add him. Or just definitely at him, since we're not removing anybody. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're definitely adding him to the hero chorus. That was the whole thing of whether or not he passed this was whether or not he would move into the hero chorus. The only thing that's up in the air, that he's even remotely up in the air, is just whether or not someone's transferring out to make room for him, or they're just going to make a class of 21 as an exception. Right. Yeah, I can't imagine him transferring anybody out based on what we've talked about and what we've seen at this point. It'd just be kind of weird. But yeah, like I said, yeah, they, I don't think they're transferring anyone out, but this didn't really say one way or the other. Right. So it's still technically a possibility, even if it's only a small one. But yeah, so uh, coming into the, uh, the comedic part that I uh, personally really enjoyed was... Uh, we, we I, I talked about this i think it was uh even last episode because that's when it happened it was when baraka literally uh wraps herself around deku and i was like hey that's that's obviously gonna come up and age mentioned like oh it's probably just gonna be us we just sue basically do being sue I, I, and just it was it was gonna be either sue or mina right sue because she has no filter and mina just because she's a shipper right but instead it was midnight which as I mentioned off cam, it it doesn't make sense, but it does make sense at the same time. <laughs> I 
And Midnight was the one who brought it up, but Mina's the one who immediately followed it up. Right, so... I, I was half expecting uh, Uraka to kind of, like, explode here, but she... You know, typical anime style of her face turning red via, like, a uh, thermometer, but uh, she didn't, like, uh, explode, like, when she... Earlier in the season when she kind of, like, threw Mina up into the air, you know? But still, <laughs> uh... Uh, unsurprising for Midnight to uh, mention what she mentions here. It's like, oh, you threw your body on the line and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, uh, you know, with the whole, uh, like you said, Mina is a shipper. So, of course, uh, she immediately has to, uh, you know, one, two combo it here with. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, well, like we were talking about, too, was uh, t there has to be a, uh, a Midnight Wiggle perfect gif out there somewhere and I should find it because we're, we're, we're going to need to use that at some point but yeah there it is Mina has uh, worked her way into that frame of yeah I, I might as well just let this play again because it, it is freaking hilarious um, but right here she's like yeah you, you really uh, you really hug him, uh, hugged him hard right there didn't you it's like yep <laughs> so that uh, that realization came uh, came faster than I thought it would. I thought it'd be kind of like a just like a completely like hey they're back at the dorms kind of like you know just like random thing like in front of everybody thing. But this was you know in front of everybody because it was like the uh, just like the review of the match and all that stuff and you know her doing her job as a support hero and you know as Aizawa mentions you know she's really grown up so obviously she's matured and all that stuff as a hero from beforehand when they had that whole discussion going into the whole uh, overhaul thing. Mm -hmm. Since we have gotten more Uraka backstory, especially this season with like how her parents saw heroes and how she viewed her parents and what she wants to do for her parents, just wanting to help people in general. Um, yeah, in general, she's very much on the Deku side of things where, you know, essentially you have the two sides of hero work where you have, you have the Deku side all about rescue and the Bakugo side all about beating the villains. She's very much on the rescue side of things. She's all about just trying to basically make everyone else happy. Right. But yeah, I'm sure uh, the Mina shipping will continue and, uh, well, I, I guess Midnight could potentially be a part of it because, like, uh, she's within earshot of Mina, so there's no way she didn't hear that. <laughs> so there'll probably be some, like, uh, older sister discussion in the future that'll be awesome and hilarious, like I mentioned before. So I wasn't expecting it to be this episode, but we got it, and the Ochako meter went, didn't go through the roof, but she still obviously reacted, as we can see right here. <laughs> Now, if, if we want an actual, if we want uh, the uh, chocolate meter to actually break, we need May involved or Toga. Right, because, I mean, we all know how uh, just unaware May is about personal space, and she just, she doesn't care. She's going to, you know, let, let's face it, she was basically feeling Deku up to do measurements, and she just doesn't see that as what Uraka was seeing it as. She was just doing it her job, but it's just like on the side of Toga, she has a giant crush on Deku. So if she ever, you know, wants to steal his blood or something, she's going to like bite him too, right in front of her or something. And she's going to lose it, you know, something to that effect. <laughs> so that, that could very well be a, like a comedic part of a very serious villain episode in the future. <laughs> Yeah, in a sense, we have we in a lot of ways we basically have three very different relationship dynamics, and then we got Toga who's Yandere, we have Uraka who's Dere Dere, and May doesn't really fit into any of the specific Dere tropes per se, but she's just more or less the I'm a romance inter romance option, but I'm not really aware I'm a romance option style character, right? That, that's just how she is, but it, the outward perception by third parties, especially third parties in Uraka's case, makes it look different than it, you know, actually is. Well, I mean, Toga would also take it like that. She just hasn't ever had any exposure to me. <laughs> right. Like, if if, the, if there's ever that scene, I'm sure it'd be a... 
the Yandere would intensify on Toga's side, like, what are you doing with my, uh, with my Izuku? That kind of thing. <laughs> but, yeah. As I mentioned, this is the kind of thing, especially in the, these shows, that, like, I won't say that I live for it, but it, it's one of my favorite aspects to these kind of things. It's just, like, how are they going to do this? And it is, it is, does it, like, hit? as well as like this kind of uh, thing did for me especially it's just it, it, i always just find stuff like this hilarious and i enjoy this kind of thing the most yeah i so i have in a sense i kind of have mixed feelings about anime romance like i really like rom-com in general doesn't matter what it is but i do like romantic aspects in shows and games and anything like that I specifically have mixed opinions on anime romance, though, because it's generally it's either done really well or it's done really anime. <laughs> and most of the time doing it really anime is usually pretty shitty because it's cases like Kinata and Naruto, where it's basically there's there's allusion to romance, but never any actual romantic development until suddenly, oh, no, they're together. Right. It's, there. There is just like that just speaking on that really quick it's like so she's like had a crush on him forever basically ever since they were like young in school say like however many episodes that was into the show whenever Hinata was introduced and then they did that whole backstory with her where like when they were super little kids like before the show even started like she liked him so for the longest she time she's liked him like episode like three or four but yeah I mean, she was introduced fairly early on. You're right. It's just been a long time since I've actually seen that show, but I still remember the majority of, like, just the, the writing and how they did it. But it's just like, well, you know, would it have been better if they were, like, somewhat together for the majority of the show? I don't know how you could have written that in, a, in like, a super show like that. But I, like, like you said, I, I didn't really enjoy the fact that it was, like, pretty much just one-sided and then all of a sudden it's like naruto just comes to the realization of oh she's in love with me and i guess i kind of like her too and then boom they're together in like the final movie or whatever that happens like uh between uh that and you know um boruto or whatever like when they actually get married it's like oh all of a sudden they're getting married it's like yeah okay <laughs> Yeah, no, like, I actually really liked Tina Dunn. I kind of hoped that there would actually be some sort of development on that. That was one of the main things, one of my main issues with Naruto, and one of the reasons why I didn't really carry into Shippuden, because even though I'd never actually watched all of Shippuden, I knew how that was going to resolve, both because of my anime knowledge and because I did know that while well, eventually they get together, it wasn't until the very end. So yeah. I knew how it was going to go, and it's like, eh. Yeah, about halfway through Shippuden, a major event occurs, and then they kind of just forget about it until, like, 70 episodes later, I'd say, and Naruto just comes to that realization, like, he basically, uh, <laughs> if anybody out there knows the South Park reference, where... Kyle's just like, you, Cartman, you've always been a dick to me and you've always ripped on me for being a Jew. And Cartman's like, when have I ever ripped on you for being a Jew? And they literally do like the montage of every time up into that point in the series where Cartman like gives him shit for being a Jew. That, that was basically what happened with Naruto is he has that like flashback realization of all the Hinata and everything that she's done for him and how she feels about him. And he just basically dings in his head like, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, it's overall, that's my issue. Is like I do actually really like romance plot lines in shows. It's usually one of the main like driving forces for characters for me. Uh, like driving interests in characters for me is how they romantically uh, interact with each other. I'm not really so much of a shipper, per se. Like, I don't sit here and be like, oh, no, those two should be together. I right. just kind of, I like to see how it plays out by itself. But that's in general one of my issues with anime is anime is very hit and miss on that topic because, like I said, a lot of them just turn out like the whole Naruto Hinata thing where it's basically like there's no actual romantic development 
they're just suddenly together at one point or they just never actually do it they basically just tease the whole time of like okay here's all the different romance options for the character but they never pick one over the course of the show it always just ends open-ended as they never actually get together with any of them right and at the end of the day i mean you can have those fan bases like you know take we'll, we'll just use one of our shows for example with ruby the whole bumblebee versus black sun thing where it's just like you can like whoever you want and that's fine you can ship whoever you want you can speculate you could throw out reasons why till the end to the end of time whatever that's fine you can you can do that i don't have any problems with that um, i'm not one to usually do that kind of like oh they should be with this person or they should be with this person like age said i'd rather just see how it plays out whatever but i'm i'll have more of an issue if it doesn't actually play out because that almost feels like a cop-out from the author that's just kind of like watching the ship battles going on and then not wanting to like piss off a specific fan base it's like at the end of the day this is your product this is your ip this is your story while that stuff will be going on in the background one would assume that say in this case say for sake of just how this is going say deku and ochako get together not surprising but do pick one you know what i mean don't yeah. leave it open-ended just this is your show and i'm the writer say say i would say what i was writing this show and i'd just be like i would pick one no matter what the community was saying or anything like that i i wouldn't just like oh, I, I can't like pit I, at the end of the day i think that pisses off more people then it's like oh well if i leave it open-ended people will just kind of like leave it alone it's like no i think you just need to pick one <laughs> You need to pick one, but you do also kind of need to be at least a little smart about it, because sometimes there is definitely cases where you can pick the wrong one. Because, like, for example, uh, older show Vampire Night, that pissed the hell out of a lot of people, myself included, because uh, the author did end of the show finally pick one, but he picked the weirdest option that had the least build up to it so like full what a twist and like yeah why <laughs> it was just it just ended up leaving a whole big like question mark at the end of the show that upset a lot of people who watched it hmm. yeah i can't speak on that personally because I, well i've heard of that show i've never watched it or know really anything about it so i, I, so I liked it back when i very first watched it primarily just because it was literally one of the first anime I ever watched. But it really was not actually that good of a show. It was more or less just I was ignorant to anime in general and just was kind of fascinated by pretty much everything that I was watching at that point. In retrospect, a few years later, going back and rewatching, and I was immediately like, oh, why was I into this? Right. But it's really not that great of a show. It's basically just a very stereotypical uh edgy uh freaking shoujo romance uh -huh. which is fo it's focused around just the girl and her like possible edgy boyfriends well then oh yeah um we got a little not a, not a terrible show but it's definitely not great it's very average right no, we got a little off course there, but uh, it was still relevant to this whole conversation going on with just like romance options and just general stuff like that uh, for what it is. Um, At some point, we might need to actually just make a whole video on the topic because there is more to be said on it. Right. It'll probably we'll, we'll probably do just like a you know whenever we get around to doing uh just like hyper specialized uh, videos on just like certain things like this for example. Um, we'll we'll dive more into that for a. Uh, that kind of thing but that was just something that i wanted to mention of that's just one of the things that i really enjoy for uh things like this personally is well uh even if there is no choice made i still love the just the comedic and how how most shows do it um since i haven't seen a lot of anime i'm probably still in like you know the mid-teens uh for completed shows um for the most part from what i've seen i have enjoyed most of the stuff that occurs that is very similar to this this situation right here and, and that's yeah what i like usually take out of shows like this especially when they're a shonen like this how they just like kind of break up the show with comic relief 
and or like comedic romance relief with how you know the awkward teenageness basically it's always just it's yeah, always like just it. fun to just kind of see and just like yeah that was hilarious like i said while the actual romance plot lines themselves are very hit or miss for me in anime it's really hard to do wrong for romantic comedy in my books like very little romantic comedy falls flat for me pretty much any time comedic romance stuff comes into play i'm usually pretty happy right. and we have an in-series shipper so how about that i don't know how often you see you have a mina <laughs> character and well I, let's face it if midnight finds out about anything like that she seems to be the kind of person that would be a like a shipper in general because she's midnight that's just she's she's the rated r hero basically so <laughs> yeah she's all about any sort of freaking teenage romance nonsense so that's like she's always freaking looting after the students right she she's basically like almost like kind of like how mike guy is just like dive in youth in, in naruto she's just the more feminine version of mike guy basically <laughs> so just just like the whole thing in the intro with her wiggling she's her wiggleness has intensified tenfold this season just because of that whole intro where all my just kind of looking at her like how the hell is she doing that <laughs> do you even have bones <laughs> right <laughs> She, at this point she's like kiff from futurama i actually don't have bones <laughs> but yeah i think uh, that's a pretty good uh, stopping point for this discussion because we've gone sort of off the rails but that was just kind of some stuff i wanted to talk about um just to kind of have a discussion about you know this kind of thing in general in a way and just how this episode is just like a prime example of this kind of thing especially with how it, it turned out because i wasn't expecting that to be this episode i honestly thought it'd be a little bit farther down the line but hey why not just do it now and i, I called it last week it was there I, I said they were gonna do this and i could feel it coming which isn't a really big like oh my god i can't believe he called that because it's, most of these things are pretty like yeah that's going to happen like it's not like something i'm like oh man i predicted like this specific event was going to happen like three seasons ago you know that kind of prediction but it's still fun for me to be right about these things right here <laughs> even if it did happen literally the next week so, still called yeah. it boosh making any sort of predictions is fun i mean that's one of the reasons why like i do all my random theory crafting like predicting all the roswell stuff like a season ahead of time right just, i like thinking it's sitting there thinking about and speculating on things indeed and we do a lot of speculation here in the dojo so hopefully uh everybody out there enjoys that because we speculate a lot and that's half the fun is speculating and see if any of your wild crazy theories even come through just even if it's just something easy like this one or just like some wild crazy theory like wow i can't believe i called that like a year ago and it actually happened crazy <laughs> how cool is that like, like you know like satella being alternate timeline amelia right so we'll, we'll have very to unlikely that that's actually the case but so far there's precedent for possibly maybe right it could still happen and we have freaking video evidence you know what i mean it's there it's archived and on the upload date so you know it's you can call back to it in the future you know what i mean so Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, people of YouTube, I think we're going to call it there for the day. So uh, thank you for stopping by and hanging out with us with another uh, Anime Night in the Dojo featuring My Hero Academia, Season 5, Episode 11. Uh, we're just going to sit here and leave Uraraka blushing for uh, the rest of time, I guess. <laughs> That's just going to be her default state. Well, whether that ever, uh, whether any of those relationships ever become a thing, who knows? It's a freaking shonen. We'll see. I'd like to see Deku and anybody else get with whatever, you know, I've seen people talking about, like, Shoto and Momo, that kind of thing. Um, Kaminari yeah, and Jiro, that kind of thing. You know, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, there's all sorts of shipping that goes around here. I know uh, for Deku in particular, the main two big ships are Ochako and Toga. Right. Uh not a whole lot of people actually necessarily ship him with may even though she technically is a romance option at least not that i'm aware of right especially since she's more um being more written into uh as a major character now 
But I digress. Uh, have a good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it is for you as you watch. You know, if you enjoy our content, uh, we'd appreciate, you know, like, follow, subscribe, all that stuff. If you want to leave a comment, do that too. And uh, have a good one. And we'll see you next time.